All right, so if you guys can see, and you guys can hear, and I can't actually see any of you at the moment, but we'll live. Um, okay, right. So uh, first of all, thanks for inviting us. Um, this, this ought to be interesting. Um, so yeah, so I'm Dave Steffen, uh, software lead at SciTech. Uh, we are also hiring. Um, and also helping me with this, uh, I don't know how much he's talking he's gonna do is Chris, check me on this. Uh, Jusik, is that right? Or close? Yeah, close enough, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get it right. Um, and uh, yeah, so this talk has, has been through several iterations and most recently what, what we started to do was just expand the talk that I gave back in December. And at first we were going to expand that and put in a lot of very nuts and bolts details, you know, like examples, talk about exactly how to do stuff. And that's where Chris got involved because he's got this fantastic framework, uh, unit test framework that he wrote using C++ 17 and with no macros, which just blows my mind. Um, as we went along and it got bigger and bigger, a lot of that nuts and bolts got taken back out. And so the big thing is that if you guys want more nuts and bolts, wait a minute, I want examples of this, I wanna talk about the other thing. Um, be sure to tell us, because I've got most of that sitting around someplace. We could do a whole nother talk on that. Um, so if this isn't, as specific or detailed, uh, or we don't have enough examples, let me know, we can, we can go fix that. Also, please jump in if you have any questions. Um, I can't see the chat window from where I am right now because my, my little laptop's uh, little fan is already screaming trying to keep up with this. So uh, if you type something in, I can't see it, so shout at me, all right? And Dave, uh, Jason and I will also try and help along with that too. So we'll monitor yes, that. And so you can focus on the presentation and we'll try and help with the chat. Okay, so uh, here we go. So first of all, the PhD is in physics. I haven't done any physics uh, in anger in quite a while, but this is actually relevant uh, to the talk. Um, so, uh, oh, well, let's just go ahead and get past the, Yes, someone at my company thought we should put this up because I have to get all these approved by my company. Um, SciTech, uh, like I said, we are hiring. We're gonna be hiring a bunch here in another month or so. Um, we do a lot of work for the Defense Department for Homeland Security, so I do have to get all this okayed uh, by other people at the company. And actually, our CEO read this uh, and wrote back with, uh, he didn't understand what a unit test looked like, but he sort of halfway wrote one using, uh, Chris's framework that basically said CEO's brain equals empty, um, which is the kind of place we work for. So, um, so where this started from, let's go on to the outline here. Um, this black box conundrum is what I talked about in December. And where this came from was right about this time last year, I was putting together kind of just a nuts and bolts basic talk on unit testing for my company, um, which was getting much more serious about, uh, about, hardcore software development at the time. Uh, and so I put together this nice little thing because I've been the unit testing guy at like every company I've worked for for the past 10 or 15 years. And as you do the night before you give the, the, the talk, you're like looking at stuff online and you're checking all your sources to see what you've left out. And I came across a couple of talks by Kevin Henney, which just blew my mind and convinced me that I'd been doing this wrong for 15 years. Um, so that's this black box conundrum because he had solved a problem that I'd known about uh, and then I started to think about why does this solve the, the, the problem? So that's this black box conundrum. Uh, what we've done here is taken kind of that chunk and expanded it a little bit, and then we bracketed it with two things. So what I wanna start off with is properties of good unit tests. I'm gonna assume that most people here are familiar with unit tests, they've done it, you kind of know the basics. So I'm gonna cover all these, figuring that most people know most of them and we'll just go fast. And that's how we'll fit all this in. Uh, then we'll talk about this black box conundrum business. And then having done that, we're going to revisit the properties of good tests because we might have learned something. All right. Um, so, uh, so let's go do that. But before we, 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 before we start, um, some fundamental definitions. And I've been getting a huge amount of mileage out of this uh, with other people at my company. Um, our customer, which is a branch of the government, uh, is all over this right now. So this can 
this is actually useful beyond just the C++ community. Um, I don't know how many of you saw Titus Winter's keynote two years ago. This is the talk when he was, from his point of view, he was telling everyone about Absail, which is this big, fancy open source project that Google uh, has, has open source, big, big library. Um, from my point of view, that's the least important thing he talked about because he gave us a lot of very nice definitions, which I've thought, uh, I think are kind of some of these fundamental things that get right at the heart of, of, of our craft. So the first point is that sustainable software, there's a nice definition, which is that everything that needs to be changed can be changed. Uh, and this, th this is actually quite big in the sense that can be changed, which means you can physically do it or you can afford it or you can change it in time for the thing that you need it to be changed for, whatever, right? I mean, the con is that if there's something that you need to change and you can't change it, you've potentially got some very big problems, right? Like you can't release the thing or you can't release another version of the thing or you can't keep up with your competitors or, or you can't make a customer happy or something. So um, <clears throat> there are two things that sustainability needs and the first one is programming. Now, Titus's choice of wording here is maybe a little controversial. I don't know, but I'm gonna go with it. Programming is what we do day to day, all right? We, we write code and it works, and it works now, it works today, I can check it in. I have solved the problem that I needed to solve with my coding, all right? This is what we think about day to day, all right? Like, I have to fix the thing, I have to close the ticket, we have to get this release out, whatever it is. <clears throat> so that is, uh, a necessary step, right? Without that, you can't do anything else, but it isn't sufficient. Uh, Titus's definition, which I like, is that software engineering is programming integrated over time. Not only does this work now, but this must continue to be work and to be valuable to my company for the lifetime of this code or this project or whatever. And it has to keep working despite all, all the horrible things that'll happen, like the customer needs it to do something else or the competition comes up with something and you need to react or you need to upgrade to a modern compiler because of meltdown inspector bugs or whatever it is, right? Time is gonna happen to your software and it needs to keep working and to remain valuable and to remain sustainable as this happens, okay? So the point is that software is not sustainable without engineering for it. And the other point is that software engineering is an additional set of skills, right? I mean, we all know how to program. Hopefully we all know how to program around here. In, the, in, this, in this group, I figure everyone's probably pretty good at that. Software engineering is a whole additional set of things that you worry about on top of that. So programming is what the programmers worry about at night. Like how do I make this thing work tomorrow in order to get it done? Software engineering is what team leads worry about, right? If I do this, is it gonna bite me in six months or a year? And am I gonna, and, Am I gonna be able to keep using this five years from now when the operating system has changed? So these, these will come back. These are very useful, they're not just useful for unit testing, they're useful in general. Uh, but these will come back, we'll talk about these as we go through. So let's start with properties of good tests. And as a shortcut, um, this is one of my favorite talks and I make my whole team watch this. This is uh, Titus Winters and Hiram Wright from Google uh, huh, five years ago now, all your tests are terrible. This is a great talk on the basics. So, and it's also a better talk than the one I'm giving now. So if, if you want more details, if you want more discussion on some of these things, if you want examples of how to do it, this is the first place to go. And it's a really, really good talk. So go, go look at that. And roughly speaking, the, uh, the properties of good tests, the stuff they want in good tests, are more or less these five things. Correctness, readability, completeness, demonstrability, which I can never say properly and might not spell right all the time, uh, and resilience. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick run through these and just talk about what these are. Uh, but before we do that, there's kind of a property zero without which nothing else works, and that is existence, okay? Tests must exist. And if tests don't exist, none of the rest of this matters you have to have unit tests. And uh, this is gonna come back and, and uh, rear its head a couple of times. Um, the point is that bad tests are almost always better than no tests. And I really mean almost always. Um, it is difficult to write tests that have negative value. 
Um, I, I've seen it once in a situation which was uh, dysfunctional in every way, shape, and form, right? I mean, it's hard to be in a situation so bad that you can try to write tests and it isn't worth the effort, okay? Um, so, you know, properties one through five there, in real life, practically, you can almost never get all of them. You probably can't ever get all of these. I think most of the time you can get most of them. And I think all the time you can get some of them, right? But even if you can't get these, just having tests is better than not having tests. So don't get tripped up or, well, I can't write a test that has all these properties. So I'm just going to, I don't know, give up and go home and call the number for that truck driving school I saw on the way in. Even bad tests are worth it. All right. Okay, so let's just take a quick run through these five things. So here's number one, correctness. And we start with, you know, the most obvious thing. You have to test that the code works. And you'd like to think this is obvious. I think we all think it's obvious. If you've got junior developers on your team, maybe they don't think it's obvious. Um, so things like don't depend on known bugs, right? Now, this is so obvious, we don't have to spend time on it, but it bears repeating especially again if you're talking to new programmers or junior developers or someone who's been around for a long time but they haven't been exposed to unit testing which is a surprising number of people out there in the community um tdd this is test driven development uh, i assume everyone knows what this is uh, i've got some uh, references at the end um uh, phil nash has given some great talks uh, at cppcon about uh, test driven development using his unit test framework which is called catch good talks. So you can go the, go see those for some details. Uh, but the point is that when you find a bug, right, I mean, your, your program is out in the wild or one of your testers find it or whatever, the first thing you do is write a unit test that demonstrates the bug. And presumably that test fails because the bug still exists, right? So you write a unit test, which turns red, which shows that you found the bug. And then you fix the bug and the test now passes, right? And the reason you do this is to prove that you found the bug and to prove that your fix fixed it, right? And in the process, you've proved that your unit test is valuable, right? Your unit test shows the thing you're trying to fix and shows that it's wrong. And then you fix it and your unit test shows that it's right. So you're sort of showing that your unit test actually does what it is intended to do. Uh, and don't test unrealistic situations. So I'm gonna steal a joke from Titus and Hiram. Uh, like if, if you have an unrealistic mock, so mocks, Right, so let's say you've got a unit test and your unit test uh, needs to have the world set up, right? You, 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 need the, you need the world in order to run your little bit of test code on something. And the world is hard to set up, right? Takes days, we, we've heard. So you don't wanna set up the whole world for your unit test environment, it's too much work. So you make a mock of the world, but maybe your mock is flat. Ah, it's close enough, right? And then you do all this unit testing using a flat world. Well, that's great, but you've only proved that your code works in a very unrealistic situation. Your code is supposed to work with the real world, which is not flat. How much have you really tested, right? Have you really established this? So don't rely on carefully crafted situations for your testing, right? You wanna test in realistic situations. Okay, uh, this is a big thing. And again, this looks obvious at first, right? You wanna make sure that the answer you're looking for is the right answer. This could be very difficult. You need to clearly define what a right answer looks like. So for example, if you've got a whole pile of floating point code, right? The answer you get is gonna have some round off in it someplace, right? You start with some binary bits of input, which are all floating point numbers or whatever they are. You do your thing, there's some round off in there someplace, right? And it isn't generally the case that every single bit of your output is significant, right? How do you handle round off? How close to this answer do you have to get? So consider what happens if someone goes and optimizes some of that floating point or changes your command or your, your, your uh, compiler flags right, and changes something about your floating point, or you go to a different machine. This doesn't happen very often, but back when I was in graduate school, we had a deck alpha. You would get different floating point results out of that. Your unit tests still need to pass, even if you get slightly different answers, and it can be very difficult to figure out what the right answer is, like how much round off is acceptable. Um, 
And uh, so in that talk, uh, Winters and Wright, uh, they jump up and down. They have this hilarious example, which is a, a JPEG compression algorithm. And someone had a unit test for this, which is that they took a picture of Rick Astley and they compressed it and they got the answer. And then they put that answer in their unit test and says, when you compress the picture, you should get this. In other words, they're demanding that the output of the JPEG is exactly a result. And they got that result by run running the code, right? Now they make fun of this and justifiably so, right? This is not good. Because what's really happened is that the person who wrote this didn't take the time to correctly define what right means, okay? All they've done is they've said, this hasn't changed since the last time, right? And this is a difference, right? There's proving it's correct and proving it got what it did the last time you did it, okay? So I'll just point out that, okay, sure, you should go write tests that actually say, look, what you did is correct, right? This thing works. You should do that. That can be really hard, okay? I used to work in tracking, and you've got some huge Kalman filter with coordinate transforms and probability stuff, and you name it. Figuring out exactly what the right answer ought to be in a certain condition is very difficult. Most of the time for stuff like this, maybe you've got another implementation in MATLAB or something. And so you run that and you get an answer out and you say, all right, my, my C++ ought to do that. But again, how much round off are you prepared to take, right? How close to that answer is still good enough for your purposes? It can be a very difficult question to answer. But saying all that, right? And here's where I disagree a little bit with, uh, with all due respect with, you know, Titus and Hiram, even this hasn't changed is really useful, okay? Um, Quick, uh, quick anecdote. Uh, a while back, I was working on a pro project and it was, uh, the big part of it was this big, huge search over hundreds of billions of things, okay? And it was a multi-threaded thing, right? We're digging through all this stuff looking for, quote, the best one, all right? And uh, this is a prototype and I came on just as we were taking it from prototype to a real thing. So the first thing I did was precisely this. I wrote a system test that's like, look, here's, here's some stock input. Let's run it through. Let's get the output. Let's just store that. And every time we run this, we'll diff against that output. And we'll see if it changes, right? Just a text file. And yeah, like, this is the simplest, stupidest thing, right? And we knew that this was a maintenance problem because every time we changed the algorithm to tweak it, we'd have to rerun our, all of our tests and get new gold standard data. But this totally saved our butt because after I'd been working on this for a couple of weeks, I noticed that the thing failed, right? We run it, we compare against what we got last time and it failed. So I had a little thing that turned red. We hadn't changed anything, right? And I run it again and it works. So I keep working and then I run it again and it fails. And we've all had these days, I, I called it, it's a Heisen bug, right? It's a bug until you look at it, right? Or maybe you are a whole Heisen bug, right? You've got Heisenberg's uncertainty principle going on and it works if anyone else looks, right? Like, you know, your, a colleague comes over and looks over your shoulder and then it works. And as soon as they turn around, it doesn't work anymore, right? We've all had those days, right? And you know, generally at some point you just go home, right? It's like computers are non-deterministic. I don't understand anything in the world anymore. Okay, fine. Well, what, what it turned out is that it was failing for me because I had more cores running this search than anybody else did. And then we put it on a machine with a whole bunch of cores and it was failing all the time. And so after some investigation, we realized that our search uh, criteria, right? The predicate for our search wasn't correct and it wasn't strict weak. So the answer you got depended on which thread got to it first, right? It would have taken us months to figure this out. If I hadn't done the stupid, obvious, silly thing of just, you know what? I wanna make sure it got what we got last time. And that pointed us right to it. So remember rule zero, you must have tests, even stupid tests that impose maintenance burdens or are gonna break on a whim and which no one likes. They're still better than nothing, right? So don't not test because you can't do a perfect job of it. Go write bad tests, like start with the bad tests. They're still better than nothing. Okay, correctness. Um, Here's another obvious thing. Test the correct code. Now, how many times have you seen this, right? I've got a widget test. This, by the way, I think is the first bit of Chris's code that we've put up. 
Uh, and I'll just make a comment because a lot of the really cool stuff about his testing just didn't make it into the talk. There are no macros here. This is, in his test framework, a complete independent test case, right? And you can see what he's done. He's done something clever here where you've got uh, a, a string and then underscore test, right? So these are like, you know, built-in unit conversions or built-in conversion operators. So that turns into an object to which he assigns a lambda, right? Like this is very impressive. And like my hat's off to Chris because this is cool, right? So you've got a widget, you're gonna do something with your widget, you're gonna put in a standard vector. So it's like, all right, look, I'm gonna make a standard vector of widgets, I'm gonna go do my thing, and I'm going to, in my unit test, write an assertion that it's empty, right? And then I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna push my widget back, and I'm gonna make sure that I've got one in my vector. Are you really gonna do this? Like, do you really expect vector to fail? Okay, well, look, I mean, so, Realistically, probably not, right? Like if you can't trust your standard library, then you got problems. But there is a point at which you start to think, you know, maybe there is a compiler bug. Maybe there's a problem in the standard library, right? <clears throat> so it might be, it's, it's rare, but it might be the case that you actually need to test standard vector. Or, okay, it's not standard vector, it's some other library, third-party library, library from somewhere else in your organization. And you have to trust this. And at some point, you might decide that you don't trust that. Fine, good. Add tests for it, particularly for the stuff that you depend on, right? So that if it breaks, you know. But don't do it here, right? Because what happens is if standard vector is wrong, or whatever else you depend on, it's going to make your widget unit test turn red. And your widget code is fine. Well, it might be fine. We presume it's fine. The point being is that the error isn't showing up in the right place. And you want to make sure that whatever code is failing shows up in the right place so that you can quickly go figure out what thing just went wrong. Does that make sense? Right? You, you want the right context when your unit test framework says that something just went kablooey. Now, the other place that you'll see this, the other reason you'll see this, uh, and this is a slight digression, but I think I've got a minute for it. I don't know how many of you have seen this talk. Uh, this was a great talk by Kate Gregory last year at ACCU. And uh, this isn't my favorite talk, but uh, I, I have empirical data, I'm a physicist, I have empirical data that this might be one of the best C++ talks out there on the basis that I was watching this one night and my wife comes by and she thinks it's interesting and she sat down and watched the whole thing and liked it. This is a good talk. Okay, and what the thing that she points out is that the other time you'll see weird stuff like this in unit tests where people keep testing the same thing over and over again, just to make sure it's really there, is probably a symptom of fear. Now, sometimes you'll see this, and I've done this, when you're having a Heisenberg day, right? Like stuff in your unit test isn't working. And it's just totally bizarre, right? You do not have a mental model that justifies what you're seeing, right? The compiler is non-deterministic. Cosmic rays are flipping bits in your RAM, right? Like all hell is breaking loose. You have no idea what's going on. So you put stuff like this in your unit test, which is actually entirely reasonable. Just make sure you take it out later. Um, but this is also fear that other people haven't tested their code or that you don't know how to test the code or something. Um, so if you see this in your code base a lot, that might be a sign of a problem not in your code base but in your organization or about how you're working or something. If people are really this nervous, maybe something else is going on that you ought to go look for. All right, that's an aside. <clears throat> um, all right, let's move on. Properties of good unit tests, readability. Okay, and the big issue here is how do you test your unit tests, right? Like, how do you know your unit tests are doing what they're supposed to do? Well, obviously you can't test your unit tests because how do you test them? Do you write unit tests for them? And then you have to write unit tests for those, right? And you immediately have an infinite loop, right? This way lies madness. You cannot write tests for your test because otherwise you have to write tests for those tests. So the only real good answer for this is that your unit tests have to be correct by inspection, right? The only way you know they're right is that some human being reads them and says, yes, that's correct. You may have other things to run over them, like uh, we'll come back to this in a little bit, but uh, uh, coverage tests or something. But fundamentally knowing that they do what they're supposed to do is only established by somebody reading them, which means they have to be easy to read, okay? Otherwise, 
you've got a problem, okay? So it, we could have a whole talk on this, but the big thing is to provide good semantics for why you're testing what you're testing, why the answer is what it is, and why you believe that, okay? Now, this actually leads to one of the first things that's surprising when you start to think about this. This means you have to write unit test code that's better than your application code. It has to be held to a higher standard because you can't write tests for it by definition. Now, that might simply blow people's minds or simply make you think that you can't write unit tests, right? Like, how do you hold your unit test to that high a standard? Realistically, most people don't, but you know, like I said, these are goals, not requirements. You do your best. Um, but this will help your test should read like a story, okay? Right, like you've got your plucky little search algorithm right? Who is the hero of your story, right? And you've got the evil data structure of doom and your plucky little search algorithm is going to go forth and search the evil data structure of disaster, right? And then at the end, right, your plucky little search algorithm succeeds and finds the thing, right? You want your test to read like a story. And if you try and do that, it's amazing how much better they get, okay? Because this gives you all the semantics and all the context of, well, why are we testing this? Why is it hard for the plucky little search algorithm to find the thing, right? If you do this, your unit test will be much, much better. And this is kind of your litmus test or a smell test to know if they're readable. Uh, okay, next of the five, uh, you want them to be complete. And again, this will go without saying most of the time, but this is actually hard to do, all right? You have to test all the edge cases and we could talk at length about that. Um, You've got a function, like simple mathematical function, right? Make sure that you put in stuff at the edges of its domain, right? Like it can take anything from, you know, zero to max int. Well, make sure you pass it zero. Make sure you pass it max int and get the right answers, right? If you've got a factorial function, factorial of 13 is probably all you can do. So that's the biggest integer you can pass in and get a reasonable value, okay? If possible, test the domain, like if the thing can only you know, give you back values, you know, that are positive integers, make sure you put in stuff that make it produce the edges of the positive integers on the way out. Error conditions, right? This can be complicated, right? If your thing's got a wide contract, test the contract, but don't test outside the contract. So as an example, you've got a function that takes a pointer for something, which, okay, like don't do that anymore, smart pointers and all that, but for the sake of argument, You've got something that takes a pointer. And the thing, if it's got a wide contract, it says, look, you can pass me a null pointer. And if you pass me a null pointer, I'll do something. I'll throw an exception or I'll just do nothing at all or I'll return some other value, right? So null pointer is within the contract. S test with a null pointer and make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Even if that's an error condition and it throws an exception, make sure it handles the error condition properly. That's part of your tests. That can get confusing because you're sort of, your unit test passes if your code fails, but only if the code fails the right way, right? Don't test outside the contract. If you've got a function and you pass it a, a null pointer and it's just gonna core dump, or you've got undefined behavior, don't bother to test that because there's nothing useful to test. Um, test recovery from error conditions. If there's an error condition that you can trigger in a unit test, make sure that when you try something correct afterwards that the error condition doesn't persist, right? Like you haven't, triggered some internal error state that doesn't get cleared, right? Um, test the common input cases. That's pretty much easy. Everybody already knows what those are. Try hard to come up with the outlandish situations. That's really hard for the person who wrote the code. That's where a code review can come in handy. Fuzz test if you can. That's again, that's a whole other talk, but if you can do it, do it. Check all the post conditions to make sure they're defined and then make sure you test them. And then I will just point out, um, you should generally run your unit test under a coverage tool to make sure that they've actually tested all the code or most of it, whatever most means. Uh, don't get lulled into complacency by saying, hey, I've tested all the code. Look, I can sit down and not very long, I can test all the code one way or another without actually making sure that anything is correct. So coverage doesn't guarantee quality, uh, but it's important. Don't let it become a, the only metric, but it's good to do. A quick uh, question or I guess. Absolutely, yes, please. More of a comment, really. Sure, I'll go back. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, so I've had this discussion with uh, classrooms of students a few times, and also with uh, Marshall Clow, who's really big on fuzz testing. Mm -hmm. And it seems that you can fuzz test 
anything with enough creativity <laughs> in a meaningful way, usually. Yeah. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Like if you are, I don't want to divert your, your talk, but if someone listening is going, Hey, wait a minute, there's no way to fuzz test my ex. There probably is a way to. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, I think generally if you've got input coming in from a human, like somebody typing something on a keyboard, mm -hmm. you have to fuzz test that or it's, broken like the, it just Absolutely. It, it takes a human input it's wrong until yeah. you fuzz test it right fuzz testing internally i had yeah i mean again hard to do but useful that might not technically fall under unit testing from a lot of people's point of view that might be a different thing totally agree. Still important. yeah, yeah. Right. cool all right everybody with me keeping up anyone want to complain about anything so far <laughs> all right I here we go quick, quick question oh sure uh, any recommendations for fuzzers and coverage tools? So I've never actually gotten to fuzz test very much. I got, you know, almost there on one project and then something happened. Um, for code coverage, I, I compile with GCC and I use its coverage and just kind of tweak it. And what I do is uh, run your unit test with your coverage tool, but don't do anything else. And then grab all that coverage output and make your web page and look at that. Uh, that's all I can say about that. Fuzz testing. Anyone got ideas for fuzz testing? If you're using Clang libfuzzers built in uh, as a fuzzing sanitizer, that's probably the easiest one to test with. I have a question. Um, I'd like to hear your um, opinion on completeness versus performance. Uh, because sometimes, like, Tests can be slow if they're very complete. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's a hard one. Um, so you've got these, just like any hard engineering problem, right? You've got two things that conflict and you want them both. So there are strong statements made that unit tests have to be super fast. Like if it takes, if you're typing at your command line and there is a noticeable delay between when you hit enter and your unit test's complete, you got a problem. Like some people will go that far. Um, you can have sets of unit tests, like most unit test frameworks will let you like put tests in a category or tag them. Chris, uh, do, does, does, uh, does your thing, can you tag unit tests and put them in categories yet? Like. So, uh, sort of. <laughs> okay. So, so like, I, I know Google test, I know catch does like, like you can tag them. And so you might have a bunch of tests tagged to say, these are the runs that get run by default every time you do whatever. And here's another set that only run when I do a nightly build, for example, those can go longer. So it's not a problem, right? That'd be my, my best guess. Um, the other thing is to, to distinguish between like unit tests that test for correctness and unit tests that test for performance. And that's things like, I should be able to connect to my server in less than five seconds, right? Or my common filter update should run through in less than 100 milliseconds or something, right? And be careful because those aren't actually correctness requirements. Those are performance requirements. And to do those, you want benchmarks, which is a whole separate thing. And you might use your unit test framework to do benchmarks, but those aren't unit tests. That's not correctness. That's a different thing. And sometimes performance tests are what really take the time because you want to grind something through a hundred million things and you know make sure it finishes in a certain time. Does that answer your question at least a little bit? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thanks. Okay, I want I to hear cool. your opinion on that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, it can also be pointed out that tests that take so long to run, no one ever runs them, aren't actually that useful. And so there is there's definitely a tra an engineering trade off there. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's press on. Uh, demonstrability, this one takes some people by surprise. You might not have heard of this. Unit tests should act as documentation and they should be the go-to place to look, for, to, to look for how to use your code and what the right way to use it is. And this is kind of, this is a new thing for a lot of people. Um, and this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, about how they should be readable and they should tell a story. Ideally, the story they tell is, this is how you should use my code. Um, in order to get this, this goes back to something we mentioned earlier. We want to test in realistic situations. You want to write unit tests that use your code 
the way the users of your code are going to use your code. Now, of course, the user of your code may be you, but you still would like this to be testing in a realistic situation the way it's supposed to be used, right? You should test only using the public API, just like the users do. No white box testing. That's the big, that's whole, part two of the talk is all about that. We'll come back to that. But the point is, if it's really hard to test or if it's clunky to use your code to test the thing you got to test it, it might just be hard to use, period. So this is the big, this is the big reason you do test-driven development, right? You test, like where you write the tests before you write the code. Because if you knew you have to test, you wouldn't have written it that way is a very common thing, okay? It turns out that <clears throat> forcing yourself to do this is a source of design pressure for you to improve the design of your code. Now, the thing that I was taken by surprise way back when I first hit this the first time is specifically that writing for testability is a big architectural thing. That isn't just an afterthought. Design for that up front. Okay. Uh, running late, pressing on. Uh, resilience. A test should have minimal or ideally zero dependency on anything outside the test. This can be hard, but you really want to avoid flaky tests, which are non-deterministic, right? Like you run them most of the time and they only fail every now and then. This is not good, right? You can't tell, you can't trust them, right? This is typically if they depend on timing or external state, right? Like your unit test for your server connection thing relies on a test server being up. And if it's down because someone unplugged something, your unit test fail, but that's got nothing to do with your code, right? Non-deterministic fails are a huge problem. Um, or external state like the network has to be up or a file has to be in the right place or something like that, okay? Um, this leads to flaky tests and these are a huge problem. I've actually seen all testing on a project turn off because they were non-deterministic. Um, with and you can predict how well that worked out. It was just a complete disaster. I don't work there anymore. Um, the more bits that enter and leave your little hermetically sealed unit test, the more things can cause false failures or cause other problems. You really want to avoid that. That can be really hard, right? Like again, you can't always do that, but you want to try. The other thing you want to avoid is brittle tests which are deterministic, but they depend on stuff they shouldn't. Now, this is a software engineering issue and not a programming issue. A lot of the other stuff we've talked about is just like, how do I make my unit test so that they're right? So that I can prove my test is good and I can go home and I can sleep well at night. This is very much a software engineering, a long-term issue, right? So dependencies on implementation defined behavior. You, again, go back and watch that talk from Titus and Hiram. Uh, they talk about, you know, someone is testing an unordered map or like, like a hash container and they put in three, five, and eight. And then they test it by iterating through it and making sure that you get three, five, and eight in that order. That's not what hash maps do, right? This one might, but somebody on the other side of your organization comes up with a better hash map and they change the implementation and that gives you the stuff in a different order. Your test just broke. Okay, this is another variation on what does the right answer really look like, right? The, really, the right answer didn't depend on the order of the stuff, just depended on that it, it was there, right? But this kind of thing can make incredibly brittle tests which are a maintenance burden long-term, right? You change something and something totally unconnected breaks and it shouldn't have. Um, be real careful when you're testing with log files. Now, sometimes you're looking at log files because that's what you're testing. I wanna make sure that this thing got logged right. Well, but look, first of all, log files have timestamps in them frequently. Okay, well, that's obvious, right? You're gonna have to do some kind of regex or something to take out the timestamp. It'll be different every time you run. But log files also have a tendency to have file and file names and line numbers in them. Which means if you're depending on that in your unit test, your unit tests get broken when someone reformats the code, right? This is a software engineering nightmare, right? Someone does something that changes literally nothing in your test break for no good reason and someone has to go fix it. Don't do that, all right? Um, you will also find, this is more common, um, that your unit tests depend on which order they get run in, right? Because like the first one that runs sets up some state that the next one depends on. Don't do that because someone comes up with some kind of fancy unit test framework, comes back to how long they, they run. What if you come up with a unit test framework that can runs all your unit tests in parallel? but now you don't know what order they run in and a bunch of stuff starts flaking out because they depend on the other one getting run first, right? Don't do that. Hey, Chris, how hard would it be to get your unit test framework to run everything in parallel, spin, spin off each thing into a separate thread? Well, actually that's supported, yeah. 
well, okay, there you go, right? So if you're using his thing and test B depends on test A already having been run, you're already hosed. So don't do this. Okay. So let me try and wrap all this up. And I've been going fast. Um, here's the point. The tests in an ideal world, they should fail because the code under test fails and for no other reason. That's pretty much a direct quote from Hiram Win or, for, or from, uh, from Titus Winters, all right? This is what you want. All this stuff we just talked about is kind of at least a good attempt to list all the things you got to do to get that. Now, there's one thing that's very hard about this, and a lot of people find it hard, maybe hard emotionally to go unit test their code, because it means you have to hate your code. I'm going to go try and break it. This is like, I have an antagonistic is attitude towards this. Most people write unit tests because they want to prove that their code works. We're going to come back to this, but what you really have to do is take the test of, I have to go make, I have to try to prove that my test doesn't work. And only if I've tried that really hard, do I know that it's okay and that I can sleep well at night. All right, so that's the first, uh, this is a quick run and ha, quick, it's only taken 40 minutes. Oh crap, we're running late. Any questions to, to this point? Okay, I, I hear silence, silence is ascent, on we go. Uh, so let's talk about unit testing object-oriented code, right? This is, this is what I did back in December. Now what we're told, and what I just told you several times, is that you should test only using the public interface, so that's black box testing. You don't know what's in the class, all you can do is poke it using its public interface for all the reasons we just went through. You get better design because you have to design for testability, you get better interfaces because you wouldn't have written it that way if you had to test it. You avoid tight coupling to the implementation. If you change the guts of your class, you don't have to change your tests, right? Unit tests are also examples and documentation. This is all very important. This is strongly recommended, so let's actually go do this, right? Now, this is where Kevlin Henney showed up and blew my mind, because I've been doing it wrong. So these are the two tests, or the, the two, rather, the two talks. Uh, I think my example is out of the first one. Um, I'm a physicist, so I have to quote Newton I can't actually claim that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants like Kevlin and I've been referencing Titus Winters and Hiram Wright, right? They're big in the community. I'm not so much standing on their shoulders as maybe sitting on them, lying on a hammock, being carried around by them. I I'm basically the hobbits in the Lord of the Rings. I'm hanging out on the Ent's shoulders while they go destroy Isengard, right? I'm, they're doing the heavy lifting here. So this is an example straight out of Kevlin. This isn't even borrowing. This is outright theft, okay? Simplest class we can talk about, cup class. Uh, it's a binary cup. It's either empty or full. Uh, the default constructor makes them empty. There's an M that is empty to see if it's empty. Filling it fills it up, right? If you fill, call fill on an empty class, it makes it full and returns true. You call fill on a full cup, it just leaves it full and returns false. Uh, similarly, drink, I drink a full cup, it's now empty. Um, and there's no errors here, right? Filling a full cup is just disappointing because it wastes beer. Drinking from an empty cup is just disappointing because you didn't get any beer, all right? And you've already written the implementation for this, right? There's one piece of internal data and it's whether I'm empty or full, right? Like this, you can't get any simpler, right? Okay, so now the old approach, this is the way I used to do things, is that for every member function, I'm gonna start with a unit test. So a test framework, right? Here's all your unit tests. Here's all your, here's, here's your test suite, right? You get one per, member function, maybe two and three, if you want a separate one for the happy path and the air condition or whatever, right? And you add some as you can, you know, you get a bug later on, you add a unit test for, hey, this is the unit test for bug number 2763 that got reported, right, whatever. This is the idea, you get one per member function, roughly speaking. So let's go do that, okay? So we unit test the constructor, right? And uh, so here's, here's where we start to see some of Chris's nice Nice clean syntax, no macros, right? Straight C++, I like it, right? So we make a cup, we want to test the constructor. The constructor is supposed to make an empty cup, so I expect the cup is empty. All right, fine. Now I go on to do the next one, which is writing for is empty. And I have to make a cup, and then I demand that it's empty. And you say, wait a minute, didn't I just say that? Why did I just write the same code twice, right? And here's the problem, okay? If I'm testing the constructor, well, how do I know that it did what it was supposed to do? Well, I have to call is empty. Well, if I want to test is empty, I have to make a cup, which means I have to test that the constructor is right. So I have a problem. 
without reaching inside cup somehow and looking at the innards to see what really went on, I can't verify the constructor without assuming that is empty is correct, but I can't test is empty without assuming that the constructor is correct. And in principle, I could have bugs in both of them that cancel out. So I can never really be sure that either of these is correct, right? They could both be wrong and I just can't tell. So can I fundamentally not test this class thoroughly, right? Can I not ever really know that this thing is correct? This is the black box conundrum. If you only test via the public interface, you have a circular logic problem because at some point you're always testing something having assumed something else works, but you haven't tested that yet. And when you try and test that, you gotta assume the first thing works. So you've got a circular logic problem. You can never actually be sure that this thing is correct, right? Maybe this whole thing's got a bunch of bugs in it and they all managed to cancel each other out and you can't tell. This is the black box conundrum, right? You have to, you, you have to use the public interface to test the interface. So you've got a circular dependency somewhere, all right? This is not an acyclic directed graph. It's got a cycle in it. So there are many common solutions to this. A lot of people, things people do. Uh, a lot of people just ignore the problem. I have to admit, I've done this before. When I gave this back in December, several people said, yeah, we pretty much just ignore it. And you just write the thing and you do it. Okay. Philosophically, not satisfying, but practically speaking, yeah, good idea. Um, a lot of people do this. You choose a simple method like a one-liner, like is empty should really be a one-liner, just returning some internal Boolean. You declare that correct by inspection because it's a one-liner and come on now, let's not be silly. And then you start from there and that's where you start from. Or you can abandon black box test and leave back up and just point out that there's a problem with this. Um, although practically speaking, this is a, honestly a great solution. The problem is that in your automated testing suite, you now technically have a manual step. Someone has to go look at it and declare that it's correct, right? A human has to do it. And the problem you run into here is that now someone maintains your binary cup class and now that is empty, maybe you've got hardware. Maybe, maybe this is a real cup and you've got a pressure sensor in it or you've got a moisture sensor along the side. And so now you've got some really complicated bit of business that goes out and hits hardware and has to see whether the thing's really there or not. And all the rest of your testing was assuming that this is correct, but now it's really hard to test that by inspection. So under maintenance, you can run into problems. All right, fine. Honestly, a lot of people do this third thing. They just abandon this, like to hell with it, right? This is ridiculous. I don't buy all this stuff about how it makes your design better, right? I'm just gonna write this and down there, now look, I'm looking in cup and I'm looking at its internal state. I want M underscore is empty to be true or false or whatever, right? So I am now reaching into the cup class somehow and looking at its internals and making sure it's doing what I think it ought to do, right? So I've opened up the class and I've examined its control state. I'm doing white box testing. I want to see the guts, the innards, the gears. I want to see what's going on. Now, of course, this won't compile, right? So what do you do? Well, you just define private public up front and you're set, right? <laughs> Please don't do this. I have had many colleagues who are very smart people and they're good programmers. They're like, nah, to hell with it. I'm just doing it, right? Define private public. I'm off to the races. I can get my thing done. Don't do that. But fine, you know, there are times, and we'll come back to this in a second, there are times when white box testing is actually a good idea or it's your only good option. If you're gonna do it, how do you do it? Well, this is the first way. Please don't. This is formally undefined behavior. This is actually specifically called out in the language standard. If you do this, all bets are off. And the problem with undefined behavior, and this one in particular, like a lot of very scary undefined behavior, is that it actually works all the time. This is very reliably a thing that does exactly what you want it to do for in reasons of how compilers work, all right? And it really does have a good advantage. You don't have to change your code at all. You can take any code, you can take code that you can't change for some reason. You know, contractually, you can't touch that. Just still unit test it. Please don't do this, <laughs> all right? What's the right way to do it? So there are two ways I know of to do it, right? I mean, if you have to do white box testing, Here's the first one, which I don't like as much, but people use this. What you do is you inherit from your class publicly and you let the derived class look at the guts, okay? Now, you will note that this actually still doesn't quite work, but if you can use this, you don't have to change your source code and it's completely defined behavior. Now, in this case, it doesn't work because presumably our is empty internal state is private and you, can't, you still can't get there from a derived class. But if your class cup had protected stuff in it, your derived class could at least look at that much. 
Maybe you have to go back and change your class to make it protected and not private. And okay, you can debate that, right? This is not always possible. And it clearly doesn't work for a class that's declared final. Uh, you can run into problems. You've got non-virtual destructors, but you're inheriting from it. So you've got really, you've got memory management stuff in your derived, in your unit test. Maybe, you, okay, look. It doesn't always work, but if it works, okay. I think this is more common in like Java and maybe in Python, I don't know. But it, it's, a, it's an option. This is the version that I like where you, fine, I have to change the code. I'll go into my code and I'll declare a friend class that I defined in my unit test and now it's got access. So I can use struct cup tester and it's got a reference to a Boolean and that Boolean is a reference to something in a cup that I pass it in its constructor. And now I can ask my cup tester what the innards look like, okay? Now, some people don't like this because you have to change your source code and you have to, you could see that this would be a problem because you really have kind of put a back door into your cup class, right? Like maybe someone could like use this to, you know, it's a security issue, I don't know. I claim it's not a change that matters very much, so I like it, right? This is my preferred method. Oh, yes, but, all right, look, we're not supposed to do white box testing, okay? You can see that this tightly couples the unit test to the implementation because your unit tests are directly poking at the internal guts. So you're at least doubling your maintenance burden, if not more, right? And we lose all these other things, but look, let's be realistic, okay? It makes unit tests easy to write, you don't have to refactor anything that's good or bad, right? The pressure to refactor in order to test is valuable, but look, if you can't refactor it, you don't have time, this works. And honestly, for some complex cases, this is your only good option. I have seen classes that are well-written and well-designed, but they're really complicated, and the fact is you just can't, like, you can't black box test this. It's too complicated, there's too much stuff on the inside, and breaking it apart doesn't make the, the implementation, it makes it worse. This really is the only good option. Okay, so remember rule zero, right? If your tests don't exist, none of the rest of this matters. So if you have to write the white box test, go ahead. Uh, I have in the past talked to come, some people, I'm on this project right now, which is some very, very legacy code. We're white box testing everything. It's just too hard to do anything else, right? White, just white box test, it. it's fine. Better than not testing at all. All right, so let's finally get around to uh, Kevlin's solution, behavior driven testing. This is the thing that I didn't know about Many other people have known about this for like a decade or something, but I didn't, and this blew my mind last year when I came across it. This is the wrong approach, right? You don't write one unit test per member function because you don't look at your, at your class as a bunch of member functions. You look at it as a collection of behaviors. So what you really do is you test the behaviors. If the reason that your cup does what it does is that a new cup is supposed to be empty, and an empty cup can be filled, and a filled cup is full, and drinking from a filled cup empties it, that's what you test. These are your unit tests. This is behavior-driven testing. You don't test your individual member functions. You test the class's behavior as a whole, all right? Note, for one thing, that your unit test names get much better. Instead of just giving you a list of the member functions, now they read like the specs for your class. This is very handy. So how does this work, okay? Here's an example. Now I'm gonna write a unit test that says a new cup is empty. So I make a cup and I test that it's empty. Great, and then I go on, an empty cup should be filled, and I make a cup and that's empty back in, and you say, wait a minute now. Back the truck up, stop everything, hold on now, right? We had this code five or six slides back and we didn't like it. We wrote this code twice and we didn't like it. Why is it okay now, right? Don't we still have the same problem? All we've done is change the name, but I've still got the problem that I'm, depending on the cup class to do the right thing, and I'm depending on is empty to be correct. Otherwise, this test is kind of meaningless. I haven't learned anything. Why does behavior-driven testing solve the black box conundrum if all I'm doing is changing the name of this? Now, this is where the light bulb went off in my head, all right? We're testing behavior, not implementation. We're testing the consistency of the interface, not the correctness of the implementation. And this you have to repeat to yourself a few times before you convince that it's true and it's a good idea. If the constructor is wrong, right, it makes a full cup, and is empty is also wrong and it returns the wrong value, and all the other behaviors follow along, right, like is, you know, fill and bring it all, if they look like they work right, the observable behavior of this class is correct, all right? If I can't detect the bug, given perfectly written unit tests, right, you know, com you know, absolutely complete, absolutely perfect, if I can't detect the bug, there's no bug. And this is where, 
the physicist in me started having light bulbs turn on, right? Because physicists have had this problem before. If you remember, back towards the end of the 18th, uh, the, yeah, it was 1860, 1861 something, Maxwell comes up with Maxwell's equations, right? You've seen it on the t-shirt, all these horrible vector differential equations and then let there be light, right? So you get this wave equation. You've got two time derivatives on one side, two spatial derivatives on the other side. This thing in between is the speed of the thing, right? C squared, that's the speed of your wave. But every other time you see this, it's re relative to something, right? You, do, you get this equation for water waves and it's like how fast does the wave move with respect to water, right? Or how fast does the air vibration move with respect to the air? Or how fast does the vibration move with respect to the steel rod that you're banging on, right? So what is this moving with respect to? Well, this was a puzzle at the time. No one really knew. So they hypothesized that these electromagnetic waves were moving with respect to some hypothesized luminiferous ether that, that per, per, pervades all space. We've never noticed it before, right? So this is interesting. So let's go poke at this new stuff that we've never noticed. Let's see how fast we're moving through it. That's an obvious thing to do. So the Michelson-Morley experiment happens, famous experiment, and they get the surprising answer, which is that our speed through this stuff is zero, identically zero, all the time, exactly zero. This is a puzzler. No one knows what to make of this. So Lorentz comes along, and he's almost got relativity sewn up. He's had all the math, or most of it, right? The idea is that moving through the ether compresses your meter stick. It changes your experiment in exactly the right way that you can never detect the ether. You can never detect your movement through it because it fiddles with your experiment somehow. And in general, it does this all the time so that no matter what you do, you can never measure it. And if you do this, you get math and everything works out. But they thought this was crazy, right? I mean, this is just an utterly ludicrous thing for this luminiferous, luminiferous ether to be doing. And he kind of got stuck and everybody got stuck until Einstein comes along and says, wait a minute now. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. That's what it doesn't exist means. It means you can't measure it and your theory can't depend on it. So Einstein goes forth and he does special relativity and gets a Nobel prize. Actually got it for something else, but this should sound familiar to what we just talked about, okay? In modern science, and we had developed this after Einstein came along because it raised some questions, what we would like to do in science is make statements that can be proven true and then go out and prove them true or prove them false. We'd like to be able to prove them true. It turns out you can never do that, right? In science, you make a statement like all swans are white or you know, go back to Newton. Every object in the universe attracts every other object with a gravitational force equal to some, every object in the universe, all of them? That's a big statement. How do you know there isn't some piece of matter on the other side of the galaxy that isn't doing this, right? You can't prove it. You can't ever go out and prove that that statement is true. So we have to fall back and do the next big, best thing. Since you can't prove them true, the next best thing is to make statements that absolutely can be proven false. And then you go out and try and prove them false. And you fail to prove them false. And the harder you fail, the more we think it's right. So we can't prove that Newton's law of gravitation is correct. We can go out and try and prove it's false. And if we can't prove it's false, we think it's probably correct. And the degree to which we believe it's correct is directly proportional to how hard we tried to make it fail. So if you go back to our unit testing, this starts to sound familiar. We apply that to our unit testing problem. We say that if a class exhibits correct behavior in all cases, every case that you can imagine, this thing works, you have to decide it's correct. Even if its implementation is nothing but a bunch of bugs that managed to cancel out in exactly the right way to make your test look like they passed, the thing works. Make a falsifiable hypothesis, which is that your code has a bug. Write the unit test to observe the bug, if you can't observe it, it's not there. Unit tests are for correctness. Peer reviews are for maintainability and correctness, and it's a slick implementation. All we're trying to do right now is prove that it's correct. So this is empirical science. Whoops, actually, let me back up. Unit testing is basically doing empirical science. That's the point. That's the big light bulb that went off in my head. So let's turn that around and say, wait a minute. If unit testing is like doing physics experiments, are physics experiments like doing unit testing? And the answer is yes. The entire history of physics is basically trying to reverse engineer the uni universe's code and its logic by writing unit tests against its observable interface, right? That's what we've been doing all along since Newton came along and we started even before Newton, right? Galileo and those guys, right? 
what we've been trying to do physics all along is figure out how the universe works. How's the source code work? What's the source code look like? But we can't look at the source code. So the best thing we can do is to do what we've been doing so far, use the public interface. We'd like to white box test reality, but we can't because no one's ever figured out how to define private public before including reality.h, right? Nobody knows how to do this. So physics has had to make do with black box testing from the beginning, but the good news is that we've been doing this for about 350 years, and we've got all this logic and procedures and epistemology and philosophy and whatnot that shows us how to do it. So we should use that in our unit testing. Now, this is a long way of saying an observable bug doesn't exist. The black box conundrum isn't a conundrum. Just go forth and black box test. Now, that's where I got to in December. Anybody want to argue so far? All right. Now, this is what I came up with, and this is what I put in. I'm almost out of time. I'll run over by just a couple of minutes here. And this is where a lot of the good stuff that Chris and I wanted to put in about nuts and bolts testing got pulled out, all right? Because I have a new hypothesis, and I want, this, want to run this past you guys, all right? We started out by referencing this nice talk by Titus Winters and Hiram Wright about all these nice properties of unit tests, right? These five things, correctness, readability, completeness, demonstrability, and uh, robustness, right? I have a hypothesis. All of those properties, the whole thing wrapped, out, you know, wrapped up, right? Take all that stuff we started with. Any given one of those is either one of two things. It's either software engineering, which means we're worried about long-term maintenance and usability and reliability, and will this thing live? And will it still be useful in five or 10 or 15 years or in perpetuity, however long my company is gonna be around? Or it's just good experimental lab practice. We're doing the same thing that every lab tech has ever done in every physics experiment, every chemistry experiment, every biology. We try to do it for medicine, which is really hard, and we have problems with that. Psychology and social sciences have a hell of a time with this, which is why the physicists make fun of them. But we're trying to do exactly the same thing that all those things that Titus and Hiram talked about are trying to get us to do. Basically, unit tests and really all the rest of your tests, you've got system tests and whatever else you've got, are an experimental apparatus to observe and uh, to test an observable phenomenon, which is that your code works. So let's just take a quick review, very quick <clears throat> review of what good lab equipment should do. Accuracy means that measurements, whatever you get out, is close to some value, which is presumably the right one. Precision is that measurements are close to each other, so you get the same answer every time. So for example, high accuracy, low precision means your stuff isn't near the bullseye, but the average is, all right? You're, you're, you're aiming at the right thing, but you get you, you, any, given accuracy, any given measurement isn't near it. On the other hand, low accuracy, high precision means all of your tests are near each other, but they're, you're not aiming at the right thing. So accuracy means your equipment is correct. Precision means it's reliable, okay? And I'll just throw these in, uh, like it, we'll kind of skip over this. Sensitivity is basically no false negatives, all right? You can detect faint signals. If there's something there, but you didn't detect it, that's a false negative, okay? You didn't see it, but there was something there. That's a sensitive experiment. Specificity really kind of translates to no false positive. You've got a good signal to noise ratio. You don't get signals when you shouldn't. This usually means you've got good isolation from your environment, right? You don't have effects from the rest of reality intruding into your experiment. Unit testing, what does this mean? We're hunting bugs, unit tests are the equipment for detecting them. So if a bug exists, what your lab equipment tells you is that something turns red, I've got a bug. A true positive is that it turns red because there really is a bug. A false positive is that your tests are failing but there isn't a bug. Right, that's a false positive. If no bug exists, you get a negative result. That means your test turned green. A true negative is that you're, there are no tests. Your test passed, hey, correct, everything's good. A false negative is that there's, there is a bug, but you didn't see it. So accuracy is that you've got true positives and true negatives. Precision is kind of repeatability. You get the same answer every time, and ideally, any given answer you get has a lot of information in it. Sensitivity is just a subpart of accuracy. It's just no false positive. Specificity is no false negative. It's fine. Let's go back to where we started. Remember all this stuff on correctness? This is like the third slide I showed you, right? Don't depend on known bugs. 
right? You don't want a false negative. This is poor sensitivity. A false negative means my test passed, there is no bug, but there really are bugs, I didn't see them. Remember this test-driven development business. First you write a bug or a test to show the bug and then the test fails. Then you fix the bug and now the test passes, right? This is just calibrating your stuff. This is zeroing your scale. This is making sure that your lab equipment shows you no effect when there's nothing for it to show you, right? Like you haven't put anything on the scale, you should get zero. Then you do your thing and now you want it to show you the signal that you want it to show you, which is that there's a bug and my unit test can see it. Don't test in unrealistic situations is basically test what you're supposed to test, which in real physics can be really hard, right? A lot of the time you'll see an effect and it isn't the thing you were trying to look at. It was some other little thing that you didn't realize your test was doing. Um, I'll take 30 seconds for a quick example in the engineering world. Everyone remembers that the Hubble Space Telescope went up and it was nearsighted because they had polished this huge mirror and any given part of it was accurate to within like wavelengths of light, but it was the wrong shape, right? So when they were polishing it, they had this big, fancy, complicated piece of business that would move the jig and accurately position it because they were shining laser light through a hole and looking for a bright spot that was going to do something, right? And here's where the bug was, right? What they were supposed to do is they had this big piece of metal that they were going to clamp this thing onto. And so what you're supposed to do is drill the hole for this thing to look through and then paint the surface so that it was black. So that the only reflection you'd get was, you know, light coming back through the hole and show you what it was supposed to do. But they did it in the wrong order. They painted it and then they drilled the hole. And when they drilled the hole, a little piece of paint flecked off the edge of the hole. And then they shone the light through the hole and the light that they zeroed in on was coming off the edge of the hole instead. And this is the fundamental mistake they made, right? The thing they were measuring isn't what they thought they were measuring. So going back to testing the thing that we were supposed to test, like don't test on a flat earth. In real science, that can be hard. And honestly, in real unit testing, that can be hard, right? How realistic is realistic? You don't wanna go out and hit a production server for your unit tests, right? Like really don't go do that. All right, so uh, pushing through correctness. Um, so remember all this business about defining what the right answer is, you know, how close to a given answer can I get and it's still right because that's just floating point round off and my answer shouldn't depend on that. Remember the image compression algorithm, right? Like, oh, that JPEG compression should give me exactly this. Well, really it should have been what well, gives me this to within any given pixel being 2% off because the human eye can't tell and it's a JPEG algorithm anyway, right? Taking the time to write the code that correctly defines what the right answer means. That's just error analysis, right? Everyone who's done a freshman physics lab has wrestled with this, and I know it's a huge pain in the ass. I taught a bunch of freshman physics lab. Believe me, it's a pain for us to teach. What are your error bars, right? I'm, I claim that I do this and I'm gonna get a certain answer. All right, well, plus or minus what? All this business about defining what the right answer is is just error propagation. Correctness, right? This is going back to, you know, you don't wanna test standard vector in your widget because if standard vector is wrong, your widget turns red and that's the wrong place for your answer? That's just bad precision. It correctly detected that there's a bug, but it's pointing to it in the wrong place, which means you spend time tracking down a red herring, looking at the wrong thing, okay? Now, we get to readability. All this business about you wanted to read like a story and it has to be correct by inspection and all that. This isn't lab technique, this is software engineering. This is all about the long-term health and viability and profitability of your code base. This isn't about making it right now, this is about, it's still right in five years. Remember completeness. This is all making sensitive tests. You want it to test all the things so that if there's a bug, you know that you get it. In real life, in physics, sensitive equipment is really expensive. I understand that the LIGO gravitational detector is so sensitive that it can detect weather patterns on the other side of the continent. It can detect lightning hits, right? It can detect the shaking caused by someone riding a bike nearby, right? How much money did they spend making it insulated from the rest of the world so that they didn't detect those, right? That's really expensive. Well, I've got news for you. Good unit tests that are really ex sensitive are also expensive. They're expensive in your time and like hours charged to the project and whatever else. It takes a lot of time to do that. If your managers are giving you crap about how long it takes you to test stuff, Hey, sorry, expensive lab equipment, well, sensitive and accurate and reliable lab equipment is pricey as hell, and that's what you're building them, right? 
And of course, the big argument there is like, well, how expensive is it for us to have a failure, right? I mean, if you want me to short change on the testing, you're making an existential bet that it's right and we're just gonna assume it's right, you know? And what you're betting, what you're making that existential bet in is money takes to fix a bug, embarrassment because you deliver something to an important customer that doesn't work, I don't know, something. Property is a good test, demonstrability. This is the business about your unit test should be readable and should be a good example of everything and all that kind of business, right? This is all software engineering again, right? This isn't about making it right today. You can make it right today without doing any of this. This is about, I want this to be valuable in a year or five years because we plan on being here in five years. Finally, resilience, right? And this kind of wraps up a lot of that other stuff. Flaky tests, which are non-deterministic, okay, that's bad precision, right? It fails because someone rode a bike past or because you're relying on something you shouldn't and it breaks if someone breathes on the code or reformats the code or something, right? This is actually both. Some of this is software engineering. Some of this is just making precise tests. Okay, this is kind of both of those. So let me wrap all this up. So unit testing is empirical science. It's exactly the same thing all the scientists have been doing just in a different lab that you didn't know was a science lab, okay? We come back to an unobservable bug doesn't exist. This gets right back to the foundations of how modern science works. If a class exhibits correct behavior in all cases, its implementation is correct, okay? It exhibits all correct behavior in all cases under test. It is correct to within the accuracy of your tests. Okay, that's science. Your software is a system to be studied, poked and prodded for the existence of bugs. All of your testing framework, your unit test, your system test, integration test, all that stuff is the experimental apparatus to go detect them. And go look at how scientists do this because all of the techniques they use have got analogs for the way that we write our tests. So go forth and test, whoops, ah. <laughs> Go forth and test empirically. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for running so long. Questions? That was awesome, Dave. <laughs> for a minute, I was worried. I get dead silence. Like, oh my God, they've all left. No, no. no it just takes a second to unmute. <laughs> yeah. What comment is, well, la so last year when I heard your lighting talk, I hope it is in CPPCOM. And I heard your full talk today. I still hope it is in CPPCon. Uh, quick question. Uh, I guess more for Chris. So when you wrote this unit test framework, how did you actually test your unit framework, unit test framework? <laughs> I mean, <It's> infinite regression. <laughs> I mean, I, I would think that maybe a cert would be better because like you said, the, 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 how did, how, I mean, what was your approach? Great question. Uh, well, I did check it using the asserts and stuff like that, assuming that they work properly. Okay. So you don't have unit tests for, or you don't have unit tests for your unit test framework then? <laughs> okay. Can I, can I just point out, like I'm gonna jump up and down about the science again. That's an excellent question. And in real life, what you do if you wanna test your equipment is you have a reference sample that you spend a lot of money on that has exactly known properties and you put it in your system and make sure that your system reads the right thing. Right, like if you've got a thing that's supposed to read like how much radiation something is, like you wanna, you wanna calibrate your Geiger counter, you go mm -hmm. out and you buy and they're expensive, right? Like some piece of something that has exactly like, you know, it does exactly what it does, right? It's got this much radiation. You put your counter next to it, you test it, right? So before you use your framework to do your experiment, you test your framework. That's the question you just asked, right? How do you test the framework? And I feel, I feel like, uh, you know, the reference, uh, the reference sample is the compiler in many ways. Like it's perfectly possible to build a unit test framework from the ground up and you start with things like static assert. Um, you know, you can do that. And then right. as you get things that you know are correct because the compiler is your reference sample, then you can use them to test more things. The other option is that you've got a whole unit test full of things that fail in, in precise ways. You wanna make sure that your unit test framework reports them the right way. So you run all these and they all fail and then you grab the output and you check to make sure that that's right or, or something, right? 
which by the way can get very confusing. Your junior programmers will get very confused because you've got tests that pass if the thing fails in the right way, but they don't pass if the thing fails in the wrong way. That makes sense. <laughs> mm, expected fails. Expected fails, unexpected fails. Expected non-fails, unexpected non-fails, right? Yeah, so I now have a new definition of coding. It's the act of constructing a, an observable, observable phenomenon. Run you that by my funny, boss. The more you think about it, that's like that's exactly what we're doing. We are writing code to 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 have a, an observable effect on something. What's drawn on the screen, some other part of the code, what gets written to disk. Yeah, I'll put that in my resume now. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right. Thank